around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome each of you to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Monday. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we welcome each of you today. I pray that God's grace and goodness and mercy has flooded your heart, flooded your life, edified, strengthened, encouraged you already. As I've said so many times, we can have an audience with God anywhere, any place, any time. God is a present help, a present help. He doesn't have to come. He's already where you are, and he's there to meet your needs. And I I look at our world as we all watch the world as it burns, as it becomes more chaotic. It is without doubt Joe Biden was a judgment on America. I mean, you look at how the world has unraveled literally under this man's watch. You might say the Democrats are the party of chaos and disorder, evil. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 1, or 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. I do believe before the next presidential election, there will be mourning in America. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Mourning, weeping, lamenting. Why? Because America is a profusely sinful and wicked nation, and its leadership is venal, vile, and profusely corrupt. How about Charles Grassley, the senator, who just revealed 40 informants watching over the Bidens and would give the FBI information and it gets swept under the rug. We need to be praying <clears throat> and seeking the Lord because uncertainty, we don't know what will take place unless God reveals it. I know what the Lord put in my heart a month ago, hamstrung. I don't know what all that will incur or entail. But I do know what to be hamstrung means. It makes you inoperable. You see it happen many times in football. They say he pulled his hamstring. They'll just stop running. They'll just, they'll just collapse. You've seen that in professional sports. That's why they get that hamstring stretched out before the ball game. Stretch it. Get it as elastic as you possibly can. So when an athlete's running 20, 21, 22, 23 miles an hour, it doesn't get pulled and then immobilize the athlete. This is where America is headed because we are sinful, vile, wicked, dishonest people. It seems like everyone that I deal with anymore is in the world is dishonest. No matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm dealing with, when I'm dealing with the world, when I'm dealing with the world in general, they take no responsibility, they have no accountability, and at the close of the day, it ends up being my fault, something I did. But that's not the truth. That's not factual. It's their incompetence, their ineptness, their dishonesty. But that is the world in which we have 
began to live in. 1 John 5, 21. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Think of that statement. You know you're a Christian. I know I'm a Christian, but the entire world, that's what John said, the entire world, the entire world is lying and wickedness. So sad. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Everyone, I said this some time ago, everyone is choosing sides. Everyone is going to cast their lot with someone. Russia, Iran, China, North Korea, Syria. Everyone is going to choose a side. We are witnessing that even now in the earth. But that's always been God's way. Joshua said, Choose you this day whom ye shall serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord there in Joshua 24, verse 15. Choose you this day. You're going to make decisions and choices today or tomorrow or next week. I pray that you're wise and you cast your lot with Elohim. You follow, you pursue the Lord with all of your heart. You remain steadfast, unmovable. You do not oscillate. You do not vacillate. You remain anchored in the Christ of God. You do not change. You stay committed. When people are committed, they stay with it. When there's a lack of commitment, they don't stay with it. They quit. Some people will go on a diet, and it lasts two weeks, they're done. They'll start to work out, and two weeks they quit, they're done. As one philosopher said, I'm not renowned for quoting philosophers, but when you start it, that shows you meant to do it. That shows you're getting committed. If you never start it, you're just simply not committed. Talk, sadly, is cheap. But our world is becoming more chaotic and uncertain by the day. I believe the mass shooting last week is a profuse distraction with this administration, this war. You know, things are happening so quickly. This war, if we don't pray and seek God, it will go regional. It will get out of the bounds, and then it will become uncontrollable. We need to be praying. We need to be people of God. The rest of the program and tomorrow's program, I'm going to be talking about the nation of Israel. We may start back with Psalms 37 and pick back up where we left off some weeks ago. You can get news and current events anywhere. They're out there. They're a dime a dozen. This is an information generation. But you need to know the Word of God, how it applies to your life, and how you should be living here in this hour. This, needless to say, is a very dangerous, dangerous time in which we're living. And sadly, the church is so ill-prepared. The church is not ready for what's coming. The church is terribly asleep, slumbering profusely. The church is going to be so shuttered by events that take place in the world, it will beg description and definition as to what's going to happen. And the reaction, and instead of a response, it'll be reactionary according to the church. They, they won't have the ability to respond 
because they're so ill-prepared. They will just react. That's not what you want to do in life. You always want to take time to meditate, contemplate, ruminate, look at all the ins and the outs, look at what could go wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But when you react, that's a scientific term. For every reaction, there's a reaction. You take a hammer and hit an anvil as hard as you can, the hammer's going to bounce back. That is a reaction from the force of hitting the anvil. That's the, that's the power, inertia coming backwards. <clears throat> that will happen. In life, you don't want to react. You want to respond. A response is something that's thought about, contemplating. People will send you an invitation, you respond. You don't react, you think about it. Does that meet my schedule? Is that going to uh, impede my schedule, what I'm going to be doing during this date and time and place? So it's a response. Ask for you to respond and get back to them and let them know, are you attending, so they can make the proper arrangements. I want to go today to Romans chapter 9. We're going to read a lot of this chapter. This is a profound chapter. It is, it, as far as I'm concerned, all of God's Word is profound. But Paul is trying to give a Gentile church here at Rome a measure of understanding about the Jewish people. Say what you will, but the Jewish people are different. And that God chose one man to come into his life and to make covenant with him. Anytime God envelops you into what he's doing, you didn't bring anything to the table. Now, you may think you did, but you didn't. When Gabriel told Mary, thou art highly favored and blessed among women, that word blessed, the Greek word is eulogia. We have the English word eulogize. Of course, he was not eulogizing Mary but it's bringing her into a relationship wherein she had no part in it. She didn't bargain. She didn't negotiate. She didn't petition. She didn't plead. She didn't beg. She, she had no idea this was going to happen. But God in his sovereignty chose her, brought her into a divine relationship where she had no part in it. It was all on God's part chosen vessel, Psalms 4, 3, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. When you become godly, God sets you apart for his service. The Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. You live a dedicated, consecrated life. God will set you apart for his service. Now, of course, your part is obedience, and discipleship, and discipline. That, that's your responsibility. You know, God called me to preach when I was 12. God did not say you have to pray two hours a day. You have to memorize 50 verses of Scripture a week. No, that was my choice. That's my commitment. That's my devotion. That is my discipline. And as I do that, God then will draft me, drag me, impart to me things he wills. He draws me into him because of my commitment. Again, people lack commitment in this life. Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. I wish every preacher would read that, embrace that, and stand on that. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Every man has a conscience. Your conscience tells you what is right and tells you what is wrong. That is magnified exponentially when the Holy Ghost has a part in your life. This is why Paul talked about his conscience, and, 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 and his conscience bears witness 
in the Holy Ghost. So he has the affirmation, the confirmation through the Holy Ghost of God that what he's doing is God's will. This is why we pray that we can grasp and know God's will for our lives. So many people so many times will say, well, I don't know God's will. You'll never know God's will until you pray and you seek the face of God. When you seek the face of God, God will impart to you his plan, his will for your life, for your the purpose he has in your life. You have no purpose except it be for God. Ephesians 5, 17, Paul said, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of of the Lord is. If you don't pursue God, you will be an unwise person. Think of the statement, the wise men come seeking the Christ of God. Why were they wise men? They were seeking God. Wise men pursue God. They seek God. They commune with God. They fellowship with God. This is why there's such little wisdom in the world, such minuscule wisdom in the church, the body of Christ, because there are those who are not pursuing God. God calls, God anoints, but that can be magnified exponentially according to your discipline and your pursuit of Christ. Oh, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read my Bible. You'll never get to the place God willed for your life. Never. Romans 9, 2. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul would have given anything for Israel to have been saved, all of Israel. He said, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow, unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers, my Jewish sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if he would simply save all of them. That's devotion. Now, he wasn't pledging his allegiance necessarily to the Jews. His allegiance was pledged toward Christ, but his burden, his affection, his desire for Israel was that they might be saved. That's how he opens up Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The nominal church has no burden for the lost. This morning, before I left to come to work, I prayed for Israel. I prayed for the Palestinians. I prayed for the Messianic Jews, the Christian Palestinians. But I said, God, a lot of people are going to die in this war. I ask you, to encounter these people, give them dreams, visions, revelations, come on them through the Holy Ghost because people are going to die and go out into eternity and sadly many will die and be lost. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they all might be saved. Paul had a profuse burden for his people, chosen people. Verse 4, who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promise? Who are the Israelites? They are the ones that God made covenant with. You and I are saved through the blood of the Lamb 
and so is Israel. But God chose a man named Abram, even changed his name, brought him into a relationship with himself. And I shared with you, I believe it was last week, the sevenfold promises there in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. I will show thee, I will make thee, I will bless thee, I will make thy name great, that shalt be a blessing, I will bless them, I will curse them. Those last two, bless them and curse them. You want to be on the side of the blessing, not on the side of the curse. That's why you need to be so careful that you do not castigate the Jewish people and fall under the curse of God through his covenant with Abraham. You see, that covenant indirectly affects you and me, even though we were not the chosen. We're grafted in through Christ's work on the cross. Romans 9, verse 5. Whose are the fathers and of whom are, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. The fathers that would take you back through the entirety of the genealogy of the men through Abraham's seed, and the seed, the promised seed, would be in Isaac. I'll share with you some other things here in a few moments. But the secret to all of this is the promised seed, which was Isaac. It was not Ishmael. It was not the six sons that Keturah bare Abram after Sarah died and he remarried. It was the one child. But he's talking here about whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. He came through the Jewish people. Though he were God and not a Jew, he still came through their Lineage, her, heritage, however you want to deem it, posterity, whatever. That's how he came. But I've shared with you many times how that God in his sovereignty would draft or graft in a Gentile into the bloodline of the seed of Abraham. Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot was a Gentile. Jericho. But because she had faith and hid the spies, Joshua said, we'll save your family. We won't kill your family. She got grafted, drafted into a Jewish nation, the Jewish people. She married a man by the name of Salmon, And that's where we begin to see the genealogy, how that uh, they bore Boaz. Boaz brought forth through his loins, Obed, Jesse, and then David. But systematically, periodically, God was grafting in a Gentile. But Paul is trying to get the church to understand the blessing and the covenant of God with Abraham. Of course, these first five verses here, he's mainly speaking about the flesh, the natural part of it. But you got to look beyond that and see the spiritual part of it. Verse 6, not as though the word of the God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So many times when I read my Bible, and just like right here, Romans 9, 6, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. I like to put the word Jacob there because it helps me to understand the, the part of the flesh and the humanity. Because Jacob, <laughs> he had a lot of issues in his life, supplanter, dishonest, manipulative, etc. 
But that didn't negate God's promise. Jacob, Israel, was Abraham's grandson. And that's why you hear even Christ would say, I'm not the God of the dead, I'm the God of the living. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob speaks of his humanity, his flesh. Israel speaks of his blessing, the covenant, the spiritual aspect of it. But Jacob, that's the fleshly side of it. But nevertheless, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Let me go back here to Genesis 25. I want to share something very quickly here about Keturah. When Sarah died, Abraham remarried, and Keturah gave Abraham five, excuse me, six sons, six sons. Genesis 25, verses 1 and 2. And then again, Abraham took a wife. Her name was Keturah. She bare him Zimran. Zimran. Now, Zimran, his name means celebrated. I'm just assuming this is total conjecture on my part. Abraham was celebrating his first child through Keturah, Zimran. Thus he magnified the child, gave him this name, and it means to be celebrated. But then it kind of goes sideways after that. Jokshan. Jokshan, J-O-K-S-H-A-N, Jokshan. What does his name mean? His name means snare or fowler, to be trapped. All these names here that of these boys are not good names except for the first son there. Medan, Medan, that means contention. Midian, that means strife. Ishbak, not too bad of a meaning. Relinquish. Shuan, depression. All of these six sons that Abraham had through Keturah were half-brothers to Isaac, half-brother to Ishmael. Same dad, different mothers. The contention is evident throughout the earth with the Islamic world in opposition to the Jewish people. Contention, strife, depression, snare. So many times in the flesh, you got to understand this. So many times in the flesh, carnality wreaks havoc, the flesh. When Lot's two daughters got him drunk, the older daughter bore a child by the name of Moab, Moabites. They have always, and to this day, you see they're mentioned in the war in Psalms 83. The Moabites are mentioned. Yet, Ruth was a Moabitess, and God grafted and drafted her into the lineage of Christ when she married Boaz. Ruth was a Moabitess, meaning she was from an incestuous relationship. Now, this is beyond comprehension how that God takes these people and grafts them into what he's doing. And you think, how in the world and why would God use an incestuous relationship to bring forth the Messiah? I reckon in simplistic terms, he's covering all the bases. He's making sure that he is so just that every man has the opportunity to get saved, to become born again. See, God said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. doesn't matter who they are. He wants men to come to repentance. 
no matter how terrible. Some of you listening to me today, you're hard on yourself because you have failed God many times. Sadly, you have missed the mark many times. And you're hard, you're ardent on your own personal life and your own personal walk with God because of the things you've done. But see, God is a God of redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. God can heal all the brokenness, but that will not negate the seed that you sowed and some of the hurt and the harm that you brought on your life through your own actions. When I was in the world and crazy as a bat, there were certain things, for whatever reason, I would not do. I, I, I've been offered the opportunity to shoot dope I don't know how many times. I've actually helped tie people's arms off for them to shoot dope, but I wouldn't shoot dope. I wouldn't do it. I there were boundaries I would not cross. And, and, and how and why, I can't explain it except the sovereignty of God's preserving power. Why not go there? I just wouldn't. You know, when we're born, we're wired a particular way. I'm a survivalist. I'm going to make it. I never have and never will play the role of a victim, though I come from a broken home. I'm not a victim. I look over my life and I see the sovereignty of God and God's divine hand maneuvering, fixing things, placing things in my life to get me where he wants me to be. I know I owe him everything. I know who I was. Paul knew who he was. He said, I am the chiefest of sinners. No wonder he was so committed because he was grateful. He was terribly thankful that God had saved him. God did not have to meet Paul on the road to Damascus. God did not have to do that, but God did that. Again, it's God's choice. Just like Joseph, there's 12 brothers, 11, I should say, besides Joseph. Out of the 12, Joseph was the one that God chose. Now, why did God do that? That's his sovereignty. That was his choice. And people sometimes loathe people who have the touch of God on their lives, and you shouldn't loathe them. You should be happy for them. You say, well, I'd like to be touched like that. Again, getting back to what I said a few minutes ago, your discipline, your commitment to God. Can God trust you? I said, can God genuinely trust you that whatever he bestows upon you, whatever he blesses you with, you will not allow it to come into your life and distract your service, your devotion, your love for Christ? I've said many times, a parent does not give a 16-year-old child the keys to a 1,000-horsepower car. You buy them a four-cylinder, just something to get them around, but it will still go fast enough to kill them. But you dare not put them in a high-powered car with, a, with much horsepower because you know they're going to tempt it. They're going to test it. They're going to try it. God the Father is the same way. He doesn't put things into your life to end up snaring you or destroying you. But as he trusts you, he will give you more lead way because he sees the commitment in your heart. I'm telling you, so many people today lack genuine bona fide commitment. They're just not committed. Oh, they, they love God and they pray and they tithe for about six months and then they go totally cold, lukewarm, and just quit. Then they become backslidden. Then they become indifferent. Then they become uh, uh, soiled and sullied by the world. And then all of a sudden, Christ is no longer a part of their lives. One of the greatest compliments I get from people is they say, Pastor, you've never changed. You've never changed. 
You're the same guy that I heard 20 years ago, 25 years ago. You're preaching the same way, with the same conviction, with the same commitment. Why, why do I do that? I love the Lord. I know praying every day does not merit me anything. I tell God that. I know that. But when you're committed and devoted, you go out of your way to stay committed, to stay devoted. How many people actually go out of their way to stay committed? There are days I feel convicted. I feel bad because I didn't have the time to spend with God that I felt like I needed to spend. But that's not a sin. God does not chasten me and, and chastise me for not spending X amount of time. He loves me. I tell him all the time. My humanity sadly gets in the way of things. I shared with you, it was uh, probably two years ago in prayer. It just came out of me. It just came out like a prophetic utterance. But to me personally, my every failure was based on my unfaithfulness. My every victory was based upon his faithfulness. Every time you have a blessing, you're successful, you succeed, know that it is God in your life. Don't take the credit. Don't do the bragging, I did this, I did that. No, no, no. Thank God he did it in your life. He did it in your life. Get back here to Romans 9, verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. All of these six sons that Abraham had with Keturah were his physical, biological sons, but they were not the promised son, even Ishmael. That would be seven. Seven sons after the flesh, biological seed of Abraham, but they were not the promised seed. This is, this is what verse 7 means here, Romans 9 and 7. Neither because they are the children of, or the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be blessed. Paul is acknowledging Abraham had other children. They are the seed of Abraham, biologically. They're all his children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be blessed. Think about that. Isaac meaning laughter. And those other sons from Keturah, strife, contention, snare, Fowler, I mean, those names are not good names. But Isaac's meant laughter. Again, they were the seed of Abraham, the biological seed of Abraham. But they were not the promised seed. Verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Paul is not arguing the fact that these Jews are Jews because they came through Abraham's seed, but he's simply telling them his descendants are not necessarily the children of God. Now, that doesn't mean they can't be saved. But see, you got to understand, he's talking about covenant. Ishmael and those other six sons of Abraham, they were not the children concerning the covenant. Only Isaac, only Isaac was considered the child of the covenant. It is the children of, of the promise who are counted or considered to be Abraham's children. Now this, again, reverts back to the spiritual part. You got two, read Galatians chapter 4 with Sarah and Hagar. Sarah was liberated 
Hagar was bondage. Sarah was free. Hagar was captive, slave, bondage. This is why Paul uses this dichotomy there in Galatians 4. He's trying to get everybody to see what's going on here. You know, And I'm trying to do the same thing, though I'm, I'm, I'm pitif- pitifully pathetic at it. Paul was gracious at it. My understanding, my vocabulary, my lexicon is, is skewed and flawed, et cetera, et cetera. But, but Paul understood because he was a Jew. And he tells us in Philippians 3, if anybody's got a right to brag, I have a right to brag. As far as touching the law, he said, I'm a Pharisee. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I too was circumcised on the eighth day. I have all the rights and privileges of a, of a fleshly Jew, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about the spiritual covenant. People are struggling. I'm telling you, this is why the world is going to get so chaotic and people are going to find themselves on the wrong side of God. And when he said there in Genesis 12 and 3, I'm going to bless those that bless you and curse him that curse with you. You're going to be on either the side of a blessing or, or the side of a curse. One of the two. That God said that. I didn't say that. Abraham didn't say that. Elohim said that. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Be careful where and how you cast your lot. It is the children of that came through Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that seed, that seed, that was the seed that was blessed. Let's let's put the two verses together here, Romans 9, verses 8 and 9. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of of God. Was not Isaac a child of the flesh? Yes. But it's deeper than that because of the covenant and the spiritual application. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. I quoted it, I believe, the other day, Galatians 3, 29. If ye are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. He's not talking about the flesh. He's talking about the spirit. He's talking about the spirit. This is where people grapple. You have a faction that are the Israel of God. Then you have a faction that is not the Israel of God. Because it's flesh. I hope you can grasp that difference and understand. Verse 9, Romans 9, 9, for this is the word of promise. God made Abraham and Sarah a promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. You remember Abraham is praying and he's telling God, I, I, I don't have seed. I, I don't have a son. Me and Sarah. Now, me and, me and Hagar, yeah, we've messed around. We've produced an Ishmael which is nothing but the works of the flesh. And God does not accept the works of the flesh. God said, You're, you two are going to have a child, and so it was. You know the story. Sarah laughs. She said, I didn't laugh. She lied. Isn't it amazing how people lie to God and God sees everything? God is so magnificent. God is so dynamic. God is so great. He can talk to a billion people at one time and know everything that each individual person is saying, what they're praying about, what they're communing about, while he's listening to another billion people. There can't nobody but God do stuff like that. That's beyond our ability to even understand. It would just all be gibberish, gibberish, chatter, chatter, chatter. God kept his word. Let me go on just a few more verses here. And not only this, but when Rebekah, who had conceived by one, even by our father, father Isaac, 
For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the promise of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now that's a mouthful. Esau and Isaac. Excuse me, Esau and Jacob. Who was God's choice? Jacob. Obviously, Rebekah could see God's choice. And so to get the blessing, you know the story, Jacob feigns, pretends to be Esau. But he wasn't. And he got the blessing. He got the promise. He got the promise. Now, again, Paul sums up here, verse 11, Romans 9, 11, for the children being not yet born. This was in the mind of God. Jeremiah, he said, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's belly. This is, this is in the mind of God. It's going to play out according to God's mind, according to God's will. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. They didn't have a chance to do anything. But see, Esau did not value the blessing. He sold it for a bowl of pottage. I'm going to die. I'm going to perish. See, God in his sovereignty knew how he would handle his birthright. Neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. I just said a few moments ago, I have no purpose except it be for God. You have no purpose except it be for God. You see, all these people in the world that have enormous talent, et cetera, et cetera, they have no genuine, bona fide, lasting purpose except it be with God. God. Why? That the purpose of God, according to election, determination, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. And it was said unto her, Rebekah, this is verse 12, Romans 9, 12. For it was said unto her, Rebecca, the elder shall serve the younger. Who made that decision? God did. You can hate the Jews all you want to. God made the decision to choose a people for himself. In the millennial reign of Christ, there's going to be this glorious, glorious tabernacle temple over there in Jerusalem, and the Jewish people will serve and work in that temple as mortals. The church, you and I will be immortal. But I love this. God says to Rebecca, the elder shall serve the younger. The greater shall serve the lesser. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. I wonder why God had a, a greater love purportedly for Jacob than Esau because Jacob wanted the blessing. Will you fight for your blessing? I said, will you fight for a blessing from God? Or will you be nonchalant, haphazard, apathetic, complacent, uncaring? Or will you pursue God and say, I want the blessing? I preached a message years ago. Is there but one blessing? When Esau got back to Jacob, he saw every uh, everything that was done. Excuse me, Isaac. When Esau got back to Isaac and saw what had happened, he asked the question, is there but one blessing? Just one? Friend, there is only one blessing, and it's found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Esau now wept. He, he sought repentance through bitter tears, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews. But he didn't value the covenant blessing of God, though he were the younger. Thus he asked Isaac, is there but one blessing? 
There is only one blessing. And the blessing is in Jesus Christ. And the blessed are the Jewish people because to them God gave the word of God and to them came Christ, the Messiah. Thus we have salvation through the Jewish people. Thus Jesus said there in John 4, 22, ye worship, you know not what, but we know what we worship. Salvation is of the Jews. And all these Jew haters don't realize you live in a Babylonian paganistic world. Had someone the other day, uh, Brother John wrote me an email, and he was he was pretty critical of the Jews, that he, he's not going to be able to get ahead in life because of the economy, the interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. But what he doesn't understand, the problem is with the world and the system. You, you're not, you can't blame a person. You know, the world is corrupt. The system is Babylonian. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. But we suffer. It rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. If if people would just get in harmony with God, they would see more of God. Let Let me hurry up right quickly and close. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. David said there's the perfect hatred of God. I don't know what that is. I would never be able to understand unless God showed me the perfect hatred of God. But there is such a thing. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. See, what Paul is saying, some of you will be critical of what God did. You will castigate God. You will impinge God. You will castigate his character and say God is unrighteous. God's not just. God's not fair. He gave one man five talents. He gave one man three talents. He gave one man one talent. The world would say, AOC would say, well, God's not fair. (laughs) Yes, he is. And this is the, 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 the kicker here in closing today. Verse 15, Romans 9 and 15 For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now that's greater than any mortal man could could comprehend or understand. I don't know why all the years When I was away from God, I got so much mercy. In high school, my other friends would get killed in car wrecks, boat accidents, drownings, etc. And old David gets by all the time, just goes and and lives like hell and, and, and still doesn't suffer seemingly. God's choice. You know, people today in, in, in the world the anti-Semitism, the, 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 the strife between blacks and whites. I had nothing to do with being born white. You had nothing to do with being born black. The Jews had nothing to, to do with having been born a Jew. Yet, we choose sides and we become hateful and hatred toward other men, other ethnicities. At the end of the day, all of this boils down to one little word, sin. Sin is the culprit. Sin is the cancer. Sin has metastasized in the earth, and everything is corrupt and cancerous. All of it. All of it. That is so sad. God told uh, Moses, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But Pharaoh also, the Bible says, he also hardened his own heart. So it, it was he, he was double dipping, you might say. God was hardening it, and he was hardening it. Why? Because he wouldn't repent. He wouldn't obey God. He wouldn't turn to God. So between his rebellion and God's plagues, his heart became doubly hardened. This is why, as I get older, humility, contrition, 
is so important in anyone's life. You've got to be in the right standing with God. Listen, just like my own life, I'm in the twilight years, be 69 years old my birthday. Life is so short. Life is so fast, fleeting. Time just flees away from all of us. It's just so quickly. You were a sophomore in high school getting your driver's license, and now you're old and drawing Social Security. Wow, it happened so quickly. But I rejoice in this today in closing. There's coming a day when all the accounts will be settled, all the books, record books will be adjudicated, and we're either going to go into eternity with God or go into eternity without God. And here's the, the point. It's going to be up to you where you go. He said, I'm not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. He made provision for all men to be saved, to be born again. That's going to be every man's choice. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you shall serve, but as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Tomorrow, I'm going to address this one more time. I'm going to be speaking about how that the world has tried to take away the identity of the Jewish people. You'll, you'll see that in the scriptures here tomorrow. How Satan has sought, since God made covenant with Abraham, to destroy that people. Look at the maps in the Middle East. Israel is not even on the maps. It's supposed to be all Muslim countries. You can't take away Genesis 15 where God made covenant with Abraham and circumcised him out a portion of piece of land from the Nile to the river Euphrates. Do you think they have that much land today? Absolutely not. I could see what's taking place now getting them more land. I don't know. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But I know they don't have what God promised them in the beginning when he made covenant with Abraham. I think you'll find tomorrow's program very, very interesting, very enlightening. I want to share with you from how the enemy has sought to take away Israel's identity and also dis the, the destroy them from off the face of the earth. But God in his sovereignty will not allow it. He will keep them until the end. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great evening. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.